Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to an amazing um, session tonight. We've got a real treat in store for us. Welcome to the Being Alongside Book Club because tonight we have Sarah James with us from Full Circle Funerals, and she's going to talk about her amazing book. She's probably going to hold up for us so we can all see it Funerals Your Way. And I love the cover, I love it so. We were talking about it, I just love the whole. Your logo, your ethos, your inclusivity. You saying it's for it's for everyone. Your book, really. But welcome. You run your own. Do you want to tell everyone a bit about you that you run your own funeral directors? And, oh, let's hear what you do. <laughs> okay. Well, hi everyone. Um. So yeah, my name's Sarah, and um, I am the founder of Full Circle Funerals. So we are a funeral directors up in Yorkshire. Um, we're an independent funeral director and we would describe ourselves as modern funeral directors and um, what, everything that we do really is about trying to support people to be able to create positive connections after someone's died and or when making their own wishes so that's sort of what we're about and the book is a small part of that in and um, is about I guess me trying to make information about funeral choices and arranging funerals as accessible as possible to so put it out there so that people who want to know more can find out what they need to know and then hopefully that will help them to um, create funerals that help them and they feel a bit more empowered as and when the time comes that they need to do that. That's fantastic. And did, did the book sort of come from you setting up your practice at all? Did the book come first or did you, what, how did it, how, how did, did it happen? So actually it's a really specific conversation. So it was a lady that I supported to arrange her mum's funeral. It was in May, 2018. And uh, I supported her to arrange her mum's funeral. Um, the lady doing the arrangements lived quite far away. So she then went, went back home afterwards. And then she came back six months later because her, her father had also died and she needed to make arrangements to him. And um, during the conversation, she said, everything that I learned from, our, from the first time that I arranged my mum's funeral with you, I've taken all of that learning and I've shared it with all of my friends and they are now using that. So when they've arranged funerals, They've, um, they've just gone into that with a little bit more knowledge and they're using that and that's been really helpful for them. And I thought, well, <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's really telling. And she said, it's like ripples on a pond. And I thought, well, that's really telling. And actually for me to write down the process that we would support somebody through, actually it will not be that hard. This is not a literary masterpiece. This is, you know, this is me writing down kind of structured way that we would support somebody who needs to um, arrange a funeral. And I thought, well, let's put it out in the world and hopefully it will help some people. And um, from the feedback I, I get, you know, I think, it, yeah, some people do find it really helpful just to see it in front of them, read it, have a bit more information and then feel better able to have their needs met because they can understand what's possible. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, as we move forward, inspire, you know, empowering people to feel that they can make their own choices around funerals, isn't it? And, and bring their own ceremony in and bring their own, you know, personalities into the, you know, the whole ceremony is so important, isn't it? And it just does make such a, a big difference to how families then cope afterwards or... Yeah, well, I think so. <laughs> and, uh, and that's, uh, you know, I guess why I became a funeral director, because I think it's an important um, ritual. It's an important event. And yeah. I believe that with the right support and if people are able to um, get what they need and create something that's helpful for them, that actually that, that will be helpful in the medium to long term. There's no, you know, we don't have research evidence to, to, to support that or prove that, but I certainly believe that and I kind of see that in, in the families that we have the, I guess, are lucky enough to help. Fantastic. We've got quite a few people watching. Guys, could you just say where you're watching from for us? Because what happens then is Facebook will ping it out to the other members of the book club saying something's going on. So if some, some of you that are watching can put some comments down, that'd be great. Facebook works, yeah. you know, um, okay. you know, if people start commenting, then Facebook goes, oh, it's something it's okay. of interest. Okay, great. That's nice of them, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, would you mind reading an extract from your book? I know you've got quite a few extracts, short extracts that you wanted to share to give us a, 
a sort of flavour of your book. That would be amazing, Sam. Okay, yeah. So I've got little, I've got sort of little ones. I thought if I just do little snip bits and then we can we can see if anybody's got questions or comments. Okay, so the first first bit is sort of the introduction. So um, it's from chapter one and it is um, setting the scene. So who is the book for? It's almost certain that every one of us will attend, arrange and participate in numerous funerals throughout our lives. Many people face these experiences with little prior knowledge, and that means that it can be a bewildering and disempowering time. This book is designed to create a guided space for you to make real choices without feeling overwhelmed. With some simple information, a step-by-step -step guide and a little preparation, you can feel more confident, less vulnerable and more in control. Everyone experiences bereavement in their own personal way, but with the right support, we can find the resilience that is inside us all. If you know a little bit about funeral arrangements and the process and the possibilities available to you, it will enable you to create a funeral that truly reflects the person who has died and is likely to be helpful for you and your friends and family. In my experience, after someone's died, people find it very helpful if they know something of the person's funeral wishes. Whether these are just one or two headline instructions or a very detailed plan doesn't matter. Just knowing where to start is very reassuring. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, somebody said that they, oh, it's Susan has said, thank you, Sarah. One of my clients has already bought your book on my suggestion. Oh, oh well, I hope, that, I hope that they find it helpful. So do let me know how they get on. And if you've, if you've got any, this is the second edition, because after the first one, I got some really helpful comments from people and there were some other bits I wanted to add. So if, if people have feedback and constructive criticism, I'll make sure that it's goes into the next version as and when that happens. And is your book available? I know you said that it's in independent bookshops, but is it also available on Amazon? You know, how do people get hold of it? Yes. So it, I think in theory it's available anywhere. So um, it's, I know, it's on Amazon. It's on places like Waterstones, WH Smith's online, um, in your local bookstore. Um, and actually a really great website, which you might well have discussed on your um, on the, the book club before, but it's called mylocalbookstore.org. I don't know if you've come Ooh. across it. No. But it's a great website. And you type in the name of the book that you are interested in, and it will then um, allow you to order that through your local bookstore. So it's almost kind of the best of both worlds. We have all of the convenience of being online and being able to search lots of books, but you're still supporting a local business who will then fulfill it effectively for you so mylocalbookstore.org I'm gonna look into that Thank yeah you. it's good it's good I would yeah. recommend it um because it, it, it's sort of the best of both worlds which is always nice ah so you were setting up encouraging people to to think about their own funeral arrangements and then what what sort of advice have you got running through the book what sort of chapter headings have we got or bits that you want to read out to us so okay share. okay that would be well, great um, yeah hopefully it's broken down in a fairly kind of intuitive way so in a step-by-step -step way so the next bit I thought um I was quite keen to share um is the next chapter don't worry I'm not going to do every one but um I think this is really important and um can be really easily overlooked in the throes of everything you know after somebody's died or or they you know maybe uh, there's a sense that that's coming soon there's so much to do, isn't there? And a lot of people move into doing mode and coping by doing. So this um, second chapter is uh, where to start. And the bit that I wanted to read is um, that you need to think about starting with the person themselves. So when you're thinking about a funeral, the best place to start is by thinking about the person themselves. Before you take any action or make any decisions, taking five minutes to reflect on the person themselves and their lives will help you to inform all the choices that you make thereafter and will make the funeral truly reflect them as an individual. So what is important to them? Are there any principles that they live their lives by? For example, a love of nature or the environment? Are they a quiet and private person or do they prefer big social gatherings and spending time with many different people? And throughout the book, um, there are lots of little quotes, so little examples of um, experiences that people have shared. So the first one um, was, she fiercely loved her family. And although she was well known, 
and liked by many people. She was really very private. And that's the sort of reflection that actually, if you take the time to stop and, um, and sit with that for a moment, all of the decisions that you need to make thereafter actually uh, become easier because you've set almost some ground rules and some priorities and some kind of key threads that are important. Yeah. And um, I definitely uh, have, have lots of people that I've spoken to have reflected that actually they didn't do this. You know, they before they knew it, they were making decisions and, and, and things were happening and, and they were making choices. And actually, when they look back, they should maybe have just sat for a few moments and just even written down or just thought a couple of really important things. And that would have made everything else a lot easier. Um, and at the end of every chapter, actually, there's a little uh, a little section for people to jot down their thoughts. So whether it's somebody who's reading it because they want to express their own wishes or whether it's somebody who's reading it because they're preparing themselves to need to make arrangements, there's little sections just to jot down some headline thoughts, which will then hopefully capture the kind of major things that come up for people as they're reading it. And that will then be, a, a, you know, something nice and short and straightforward to take away from it afterwards. That's such good advice because you are right. I know for me personally, I went into doing mode and also I think you go into prescriptive doing mode, which is whatever you've learned a funeral is up to now, that's what you think you have to do. And um, I mean, I think I was quite lucky when my dad died, he had a police funeral. So that was, you know, taken that was sort of sorted and that was lovely and then when my mum died she wanted sort of us to have, wear bright colour clothes and stuff which when my mum died 2005 that was still quite rebellious to be fair <laughs> and I think it's still quite rebellious now really you know um but I think yes if I if if I'd if I'd thought about it and had some guidance I think it's not that I have regrets but I think like you say it could have been fuller it could have been more encompassing, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and a lot of it's about opportunity, isn't it? I think what what hopefully um, this book does and many other things do is just share information. And so, as you've said, so, so you're, people are familiar with more things as and when the time comes. And, and hopefully one of my worries was that it would come across um, or that people would read it and make feel a pressure to... to you know, that there was sort of a good funeral or, a, you know, the more personalised, the better. Or And so I've tried to be quite careful, I hope, in my writing to say none of this, these are, none of these are suggestions that you need to do. This is just stuff that's possible. And if none of it resonates, then that's brilliant because you've known about it. But actually, it just kind of hasn't landed for you and it didn't feel like that would be helpful for you. And that's great because... Um, it's the it's the knowledge bit that I'm sort of keen to help people with um, because we're really we're we're pretty intuitive, aren't we? Humans are amazing. We we if we've kind of got the knowledge in the space, we we often just sort of know what we need. Um, but yeah, without as you said, it doesn't need you don't need to to do every single thing you know about. But it's it's just good to have a slightly bigger tool belt going into the arrangements with. I love that a slightly bigger tool belt. <laughs> yes. Yes, I really like that, Sarah. Thank you. So what are you going to share with us next then after our slightly bigger hey, tool belt is yes. mounted on? Okay, well, to, yeah, to make your tool belt even fuller. Okay, so I've chosen this bit. Oh, my heavens, that's a long bit. I've, um, because this can be a surprise to people. And what, um, what we find when we are supporting people who need to arrange a, a funeral at the time is that Sometimes sharing this can be really helpful and you, and you can sort of see a bit of a, a you know, a, a pressure lift when they think, oh, OK, I have I have some choice here. So um, it's uh, called locations and flow. So most people are familiar with the idea of a service taking place at a church or a crematorium. For many people, this may be a meaningful place, particularly if the person who has died was an active member of a certain church or the family has a close connection to the local crematorium. However, if you don't feel comfortable with either of these locations, there are plenty of alternatives for you to choose from. Unlike weddings, you don't need a specific license to hold a funeral service, and some funeral directors can even offer a space for the service within their premises. 
community centres, village halls, hotels, Masonic lodges, conference centres, pubs, music venues and theatres are all possibilities. Or you could choose to have a funeral in your own home. So I guess many of the people who might have tuned in as part of the book club may know that already. But for a lot of people, that that's that's not something that they've ever experienced before. And just knowing that you're not forced down a particular route to a particular place can be really, uh, really quite helpful for people. Yes, particularly if people are not of particular faith, for instance, so they wouldn't necessarily go to a church or a chapel or, you know, indeed any other sort of religious venue, then, like you say, you could open it. Up. I mean, we're very lucky where we are. There's a village hall up the hill that has amazing views. And, and you just think, why wouldn't you have, you know, a funeral there, actually? That yeah. would be amazing. Yeah. And most yeah. places are really happy to accommodate. They want, the, in general, people will do what they can to help somebody when they're arranging a funeral because everybody recognises how important that event is. So if an, if a then you can accommodate it. In our experience, they will. They'll do what they can to help. Um, and it can make a really big difference. So what's the most unusual venue you've done? So <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, gosh. So, well, I mean, lots of, lots of hotels, pubs, um, outside, um, people's gardens. Uh, so maybe not so much unusual, but more... Um, unpredictable so outside yeah. is obviously a little unpredictable yes uh, particularly when you're you know sort of bringing music and um yeah so that's that's probably yeah I don't feel like I've got a particularly unusual one to whip out but we certainly do support a lot of when, when some people realize that they can exactly as you've said they immediately think of a venue for example the local village hall or place actually that there's a family or that individual spent a lot of time you, you can just get a sense that actually the whole thing immediately feels much like like something that they 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 feel that they can really connect with and that is going to be a positive event rather than something maybe that they need to get through fantastic well anybody watching if they want to share where they've been the more unusual sort of venues for funerals that'd be great to hear yeah um, i do yeah. yeah yeah i'm trying to think no i think i've had quite standard I've, been present at many standards, you know, so lesson. Um, Fab, so what are you going to share with us next then, Sarah? Okay, well, I wanted to share um, just a little bit about um, green funerals um, because uh, I guess I think that's important. <laughs> and as, um, as we as individuals and as a society become increasingly aware of our impacts on the environment um i am really keen that funerals are, 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 are as part of that um and that we also you know in all of the choices that we make in our lives funerals are a choice and um the more that people know about the, the, the different choices and and the impact that that has on the environment then the more able they're going to be to to use that knowledge and apply it to their choices so just a really short bit about green funerals and one of the changes actually in the second edition is that it has a much longer chapter about green funerals than the first edition did but um people are increasingly concerned about the impact that they have on the world we live in some may wish to have a completely green funeral whereas others may wish merely to incorporate some environmentally friendly elements without feeling that their options have been unduly restricted a funeral is often a time for reflection and including greener options can be a powerful signal to those present. Some funeral choices are generally regarded as being better for the environment than others, but many questions still remain unanswered. For example, natural burial is widely accepted as being more environmentally friendly than flame cremation, but the carbon footprint of individual coffins is less well understood particularly if you consider the entire process from raw materials to their final disposal. And in the book, I go on to talk about the different burial options and also talk a little bit about flame cremation um, versus water cremation, which some people um, listening may be familiar with or not, but water cremation is um, an alternative to flame cremation, which is available in lots of 
parts of the world and will be available in the UK um, in the next few years. So it's a, a different process, which may well be and is likely to be much more environmentally friendly than blame cremation. Wow. So in terms of if you wanted to be as green as green at the moment, hmm. what would be your best option, really? Um, so, oh, so sorry. I, no, it's really difficult. I wish I had a simple answer. So I believe from what I know um, that if you have a natural burial ground close by, then that would be the most environmentally friendly option at the moment. Where it gets tricky and why I had my grimace is if the natural burial ground is really far away and you're going to travel there every weekend to visit the grave in a big gas guzzling four by four, then I don't know what the answer is. You might be better choosing something closer to home that you would be less likely to visit. So, but in terms of the, the choice, um, assuming location is the same, then natural burial would um, be generally regarded as the most environmentally friendly option at the moment that's available to us. And would that be better in a shroud than a coffin or? Yeah, so for natural burial, all of the materials placed into the grave need to be biodegradable. Um, so as long as the uh, everything that goes into the coffin and the coffin itself are biodegradable, then I think it's much of a muchness. I guess where, again, it gets a little bit complicated is it depends maybe if the, where the coffin has been produced, what it's been produced from, how far the coffin has travelled. So um, I guess a, a, shroud, a homemade shroud in a very close by natural burial ground definitely, you know, feels like you can be pretty confident that that is a very environmentally friendly, safe choice. Okay, thank you. I got wrapped like a bit in of a the politician shroud. there. Sorry, yes, <laughs> very political in my answer. No, it's, no, no, because um, yeah, really, I, I think it's really fascinating. It's something I want, want to know. So, yeah, yeah, really. Thank you. Okay, um, we have got... Oh, somebody said they love the idea of doing a funeral at home. You know, I do too. Yeah, that sounds too. really nice. If you've got that's the room, what I would have. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and also because a big part of a lot of our work, you know, supporting people at the end of life is that they would want to die at home. So then it's a natural kind of progression if the funeral director could support you to then have have the keep the body at home or you take them into your care and then bring them back for the funeral, whatever yeah. works. I know it's not always possible to keep a body at home. Um, that would just be so lovely, wouldn't it, too? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mm. think so. Home special, isn't it? And I think, and I, I, like I said before, I think the key is knowing that that's possible because then as a family, you'll probably know if that's what you would want. And for the person themselves as well, you know, for, for people you're supporting, if they can say, actually, this is what I would really like, but I kind of understand if that doesn't maybe work at the time or if some people really struggle with that, that instruction and that direction is really helpful. Yeah. Wow. OK, thank you for that. That was really, really interesting. So can I ask what other little glimpse we're going to get? OK, so um, I am going to move on to um, more about this. So this second edition as well, I've tried to share a little bit more information about well-being after bereavement so share some thoughts on how people um, can support themselves um, after bereavement and throughout the kind of longer grief journey so almost sort of you know post-funeral and thinking a little bit more longer term um, and one of the things that I, I think are really really important and particularly after um, the challenge that we've had to funeral rituals during the pandemic is this sense of connection and um, ongoing connection and continued bonds with the person who's died and also just being more connected with people around us and ourselves actually but so I have a chapter in this one called staying connected after death um, and I just wanted to uh, read a little bit of that um, so continuing bonds theory tells us that when someone dies our relationship with them doesn't end it changes this ongoing relationship may be equally important and powerful I believe that there are rituals and activities which can help with the development of these continued bonds. By discovering what other people have found helpful, you might find that one or two ideas resonate with you or seem appropriate for the people that you care about the most. 
Some people start these activities before or during the funeral. Others consider them immediately afterwards, or you may feel that you aren't ready until quite some time after someone has died. And then it's structured, I won't read it all, but it's structured into special places and objects, um, important dates, connecting through food and music, memories, and creating a legacy as the main headings. Um, and what hopefully it does is raise a bit of awareness of the concept of continuing bonds and the idea that there are some activities and things that, that might help to promote these bonds and promote in a positive way the ongoing connection with someone who has died. Um, and hopefully it helps people to sort of recognise what might work for them. Oh, did you get a new cup of tea? I got a new cup of tea. Oh, thank you. Can I have one? <laughs> Sarah wants one too. <laughs> Where were you, Sarah? You're in Staffordshire, I think. No, well, yeah, Leeds. Leeds. Can you manage that? Yeah, I'll, I'll just get the train. <laughs> okay, marvellous. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Um, I know my friend won't, I don't need to name names, but I know my friend won't mind me sharing this. So... Unfortunately, her husband died a week before her twins' birthday, and they were two. So they, she realised they would have no memory of ever being with daddy. So she was very clever in making those connections and those bonds that you've been talking about, which I think you're absolutely right, Sarah, are so important. So what she did is she found photos of when daddy was holding the children she kept the clothes he was wearing. So she would show the children, look, here's a photo of daddy holding you in this T-shirt. Here's the T-shirt that daddy wore. And then all his shirt buttons, she did like, I love daddy with all the shirt buttons. So they had stuff to touch and feel. There were lots of different things. But I just thought that was so clever to link photos and videos with clothes so that the boys could go to bed holding daddy's t-shirt and there's a picture of daddy on their nightstand very clever that's a beautiful example beautiful example and um particularly with children um actually the uh my, the, the sort of perceived wisdom is that unless you talk about even for slightly older children unless you reinforce the memories by talking about them they will fade for all of us but I guess for children who maybe have slightly less memories, they're even more, for each individual one is a bit more precious. So exactly that reinforcing that daddy cuddled them and this is what daddy wore. And, and but even, even just small references like, the, you know, food. So, so my mother-in-law cooked the most amazing chocolate cake. And so we, we she died uh, a good number of years ago, but that's still our go-to recipe. So on every family event, you cook Nine's chocolate cake and my children, one of whom never met her, but they know that that's Nine's chocolate cake. And she is still very much part of our family life through this chocolate cake. And, then, and so she's brought into conversation. She's part of things that then they'll then ask daddy about her. And it, it, so it's just a, a small way. And everyone's got a recipe, haven't they? Someone who, you know, cooked something which is just so good or, you know, a roast dinner. or So it doesn't need to be, it can be, can be something which seems quite small, but actually is just a pure connection and link and open up, it opens up the conversation. And what your friend did is beautiful. And yeah. they're the sorts of things actually that, um, you know, being able to share that is so powerful because it means that other people who find themselves in similar circumstances just immediately have a, a few examples that will spring to mind and then they can choose what works for them because not everything's going to work. You know, it's not going to work for everyone. But just a few things. It might be keeping daddy's guitar or, you know, it would be all sorts of things. But um, if we just raise a bit of awareness about the concept of continuing bonds, I think that will be really powerful and actually help a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it's a fine line, isn't it, between finding things that you keep that invoke memories and invoke connection to feeling like you have to keep everything and you can't then move on and I think yeah. my mum had like wardrobes full of clothes <laughs> and and she was great she just said to me give it all to charity and that just so I kept a couple of scarves because we were different sizes anyway but yeah I kept her scarves um but yeah it, it just took the pressure off having to yeah. think what do I do with all this lovely clothes 
Irene's foot, you can have the clothes of a loved one made into a soft toy or a cushion. That's a lovely idea. Yeah, yeah I don't it? know if, um, can I screen share? If that, if that possible? Ooh, um, Am I uh, trying possibly, to be very... it might have to make you a co-host. Well, don't worry. If, so I have a, I have an example of if, if that. Um, let's see, I've moved your co-host. All right, well, let's see if I can... I've got to find it now, frantically. Oh, we're getting really technical. Oh, no, we've got, like, now. three texts going on at the same time. Right, so this is Wilbur. Let me see if I can share Wilbur. I think this might be an example of, of what Irene means. Can you see, oh, Wil- can you see wow. Wilbur? Is that... I don't know if that, that might be... So Wilbur is made, yeah, from a, a number of items of clothing. And... Um, yeah, and, and that can be lo- really very lovely because, as you've said, it's, you know, it's soft and gentle and tactile. And, um, yeah, so that's... that's oh, that's so done. nice. That's really lovely. That works. Hey, guys, we're very technical on the book now. <laughs> You're the first person to speech. <laughs> oh, I'm very pleased with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to Irene for creating that opportunity for us. Yeah. <laughs> Irene's book, that's wonderful. Oh, good. Oh, <laughs> oh that's really great. So was there anything else you wanted to share? So I have one more quick one, if you've got yeah. time for it. I yeah, think. no, and then, I don't know what my... So um, really, really quick, actually, but it's just about well-being after bereavement. Um, and just experiencing loss and bereavement can be very challenging, both mentally and physically. There are many factors which influence individual experiences, and people will find different things helpful. I'm not an expert on well-being or a life coach, but I am committed to supporting people to feel as well as possible after loss. So I thought I'd take the opportunity to share some things that I know have been helpful for other people. And in this chapter, so I just talk about nature, music, being creative, sleeping, which is really difficult, exercise, finding connection, and then a bit about nutrition and hydration. So really basic things, but and absolutely not specialist bereavement support in any way, but really, really basic things just to try and help people feel that there are are some things that they can do that are in their control that hopefully will help them to to just feel that little bit more hopeful and a bit more in control. Um, And that's it. I just think it's so, so lovely. And I think, thank you, because I think we... Like you say, a lot of us on the book club will know some of this stuff. But what we're always looking for in the book club is authors who have created something that we can then give out to the people we work with. So, you know, your book is so, so useful because we can all say, right, here's the book you need to read if you're if you're preparing um, to, you know, you want to be ahead of the game in terms of you thinking about how you can do the best funeral for your loved one. And yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. I'll just check if there's been any other questions. Um, Beth said empowering people is so important and raising awareness of the freedom of choice. You're so right, so right. Um, bets in North Wales so you're, right. you're going global Sarah <laughs> <laughs> amazing the power of Facebook and I Zoom know, and I sharing know. yeah well thank you so much so much for um sharing the evening with us that's really great um uh, yeah we're getting some thank yous now oh, um, well, because it's really you. really lovely for all of us to know of the resources that are available um, and all of us just sort of add them to our kit bag. So it's it's wonderful to spend some time with you.